This episode is brought to you by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study in 18 undergraduate degree programs. Visit utm.edu to find out more. Emily, welcome everyone to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm happy to be your host, Scott Williams. Before we get started, Emily, can you tell us something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? If guests come and visit Discovery Park right now, they can see corn, soybeans, and cotton growing right outside of the Simmons Bank Ag Center. And that is the perfect intro to today's guest, who um, has um, a bit of an agriculture spin. Uh, We get to chat with Patterson Freeman, the manager at McWhorter Farms in Dresden, Tennessee. Welcome, Patterson. Thank you for having me, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm fascinated by uh, um, Angus cattle, particularly. My grandfather actually raised black Angus cattle. I didn't take advantage of the opportunity when I was a kid to find out more about it. So you're going to fill in the gaps, but uh, take us all the way back to the beginning and tell us a little bit about uh, where you were born and how you grew up. Yeah, well, I'm uh, as funny as this sounds. My my mother is the uh, executive director of the Jackson Symphony. My father's a florist. So I'm sure everybody figures if you put those two together, you probably get a cowboy. Uh, (laughs) That's, that's kind of how it started, but uh, I was raised in Jackson. I did all my elementary, middle, and high school in Jackson before I I did finish up in Bradford. My mother was from Bradford originally and was raised on Angus Cattle Operation here in Bradford. Uh, That's where I I reside now. So um, after high school, I I graduated from Mississippi State University with a a degree in animal science with beef cattle production being my my specialty. Um, And then I started easing my way back into the cattle business that that led me to McWhorter, where I am today. Now, what what um, do you suppose sparked that interest? What inspired you to head down that path? Uh, I know your mom was a big educator, and education absolutely you yes, know, big to her, and and the florist company. Your dad's you know big in that, and so you know you're right. That doesn't seem like you you know if you picked what we thought you would end up doing, it probably wouldn't be cattle farming. So what? That's probably right. Yeah, it uh, it was a passion that I developed early, though. I I spent every weekend on my my family's farm from the time I was old enough to convince them to let me go and that that led to every weekend and then that led to the time when I was finally old enough to get a driver's license I I transferred schools and moved to Bradford and and I spent all my time uh, in the cattle business it it was a passion I developed early and and one that still runs strong today that's interesting I wonder what what caused that what triggered that I don't know I, I my my granddad had three girls and so there was nobody to come back home and, and I think me being the first grandson, we, we formed a bond uh, that was really strong. And, and that just passion for that industry just skipped a generation and, and landed and landed back on me. I, I guess I was that first son he didn't have uh, that, that kind of came along and was real interested in it. So, so with his influence, uh, I, I just developed a, a knack for it uh, and a passion for it. Yeah, that's uh, inspiring for all those grandfathers out there listening. Um, my grandfather was the same way. He would come and get me in Memphis. He was from Brownsville. He would come right. get me in Memphis and go downtown where my uncle, his his son, was a butcher at Easy Way Grocery, and we would have lunch there, and then we would spend time. My grandfather loved downtown, so we would spend time feeding the squirrels at the park. And, you know, anyway, great, great memory Uh for me, of my grandfather, like you have of yours. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And we still work together daily. So uh, they run Bopat Farms in Bradford. Of course, I'm at McWhorter, but us both within the Angus business, we, we kind of work uh, hand in hand together. So, uh, and we live, me and my wife, and my family, we live in Bradford. So we're, uh, we're, we're still involved daily. Yeah, it's fantastic. So um, you went to college. You obviously knew what you were going to do. Did you know exactly what you wanted to do? Not necessarily. I, I knew I wanted to get back into production ag at some point. Uh, I, I was kind of I kind of left there in a little different direction. I was in the cattle business, but I wasn't in the Angus business. Uh, I guess my first stop was Cottage Farm Beef Masters, which was a beef master operation in Jackson, owned by the Stonecipher family. 
So I made a, a pit stop there and, and kind of got to work with a different breed of cattle that I wasn't familiar with and, and spent a couple good years with them. Uh, but I didn't exactly know. I, I knew it was production ag. I knew the, the passion was in the cattle business. Uh, uh, so I, whether that happened in sales or, or how it worked, there's so many different aspects of this industry. I knew I wanted back in. I was just going to kind of let it find its way. Now, a lot of folks listening here, the main thing they know about cattle, if they know anything, is that it ends up uh, oftentimes in their hamburgers. So that's right. Um, that, that's about the extent. So break it down for us a little bit. Uh, yeah, know. well, it's a it's a pasture to plate. That's a, that's kind of how we say it from pasture to plate. So uh, I guess for how it works for us on the registered side of things, we're the the people the seed stock producers that 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 handle the registered cattle. So we're we market bulls. We we take registered females and and make them to superior registered Angus bulls. To the end, our goal is to sell and produce superior Angus bulls for the commercial cattlemen. So then the commercial cattlemen would come to like an auction at our place and, and purchase a good bull and would, would breed their cattle with. And what we're doing as purebred producers is increasing the quality of their cattle. So when they do go to the rail, the pasture, to the plate, uh, they, they can receive that, that premium for that product. Now, for somebody who knows absolutely nothing, um, explain a, a Black Angus uh, cow or bull for us. Okay, well, there's you know there's a vast variety uh, of different breeds. So the black Angus are what most of you people will see in this area. It's a black hided animal. Uh, they they they're not uh, they they won't have any ear like you would typically see from a Brahmin influenced animal. They're they're more of an uh, English breed. Uh, so they uh, most likely if you're driving down 45 in West Tennessee and, and you pass a farm with a, with a black animal, black cow. Uh, there's a 90% chance that there's some Angus influence in that, in that female. Uh, it's, it's the most common cow you'll see in this part of the world with, without a doubt. And it came over from like Scotland in the yeah, late yeah, 1800s. Aber- yeah. Aberdeen Angus would be the official name of them. So they came from Aberdeen, Scotland, uh, and they were kind of known for their mothering ability. But then we noticed that they had a really strong characteristic for marbling which is the, the little white specks that you see throughout your steak, and that increases the, the flavor and your experience at the plate. So we, we found out Angus uh, you know, were superior in that to some other breeds, and that's when they really, they really took over here in America. And so um, around here, there's also red ones, right? I see red. That's right, yeah. There's a red Angus breed. You see the red and white face cows. Uh, which are the Herefords that are in this part of the area, you're starting to see a big push for the black hided animal with the white face. We call those black baldies. And what that is is an F1 cross, uh, which would be a Hereford and an Angus mated together. Uh, we're starting to see that kind of be a popular mix for the commercial cattlemen, especially from a female aspect. They, they, they kind of combine what the Hereford cow does well and the Angus cow does well. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of those. And But you can, there, there's grays, there's whites and the Charlays. Uh, of course, all the composite breeds from where people will take, you know, something and made it to something else. So, uh, but mostly through this part of the world, you're going to see black cotted animals or, or you will see the Herefords will be the biggest influence. Now, what's the difference between, you know, let's say I was going to farm, um, cattle. And so, right. you know, I get a purebred and I really pay attention to the mother and the father cow and what comes out, you know, what, what. What's the difference between that and just throwing a bunch of cows in a pen and not paying attention to the breed and the breeding of the cattle? Yeah, that well, you can run into obviously some uh, some some genetic issues. You know, if if we're not keeping a good eye of what we're mating to what, there there's some breeds that have a tendency not to mate well with others. Uh, it, the biggest difference you'll see is when you go to mix a, a zebra influenced cattle, which will be a Bramer or somewhere like that, of, of a lot bigger frame cattle, a bigger overall mature weight, and mating them to an Angus, uh, a little bit smaller frame cow that, that won't be as large. You can have some calving difficulties there. So you really kind of have to, have, to, have to be careful how you mate him. Now, those all breeds can be combined through time. Uh, generational shifts, easing one way or another, we can do to kind of to, to bring in some of those traits uh, that we like and combine those. But but just right off the bat, if you just kick them all in and let them go, you can you can work yourself in a mess real quick. <laughs> that's why people have to hire folks like lightly. you. I, w- I would hire you to uh, that's handle right, That's my... right. That's where people like me come in, Andy. So, so uh, at some point you encounter uh, the uh, – 
son of Ned Ma- Ray, Ray McWhorter, or was That's it right, him? Yes. Was it Ned Ray himself? Or no, no. Ned, the governor had already passed by the time I came along. So uh, in the the fall of 2013, Mike McWhorter approached me, uh, being from Jackson and had had good ties with the McWhorter family for a long time. And, uh, Mike came to me and, and pretty much as Patterson, I, I've inherited this father, this farm, excuse me, from my, my father's passing. Uh, I'm not familiar with the cattle industry, not necessarily sure. I'm interested in the cattle industry, but I have this place and, and it was a, a big passion of my father's. Uh, it's, it, there's some goals there that he wanted to achieve, but never had the time to, to all his, his, his hours in public service and business and everything else and just never got to what can we do here? And he was um, for for anybody who's listening who doesn't know who uh, Ned McWhorter is, uh, he was uh, the 46th governor of Tennessee uh, from 1987 to 1995. He was also speaker of the Tennessee House of Representatives um, and a big 14 influence. years. How many? 14 years. Yeah, that's, imp- that's impressive. He was um, born near here. Uh, That's right, Palmersville, Tennessee. Yeah, and he, um, his family, little, I don't know if you know this or not, but little known fact, um, his family managed the Davy Crockett Motel here in Union City, Tennessee for a little while. Um, His mother um, was, was, uh, there's pictures I've seen uh, from the hotel of him with his mother and, you know, some of the staff at the hotel. So had a Union City tie. Um, but just a real uh, impressive guy who left just a huge legacy here um, in our region. Oh, without a doubt, it's a, it's an honor to be on his his farm. Uh, we we kind of uh, he he was such a man that could handle both aisles uh, in his political career. Uh, you know, whether D or an R, he he handled them both uh, both evenly uh, and was respected by both of them. And, and so we take the dealings of business that Ned had left. Uh, in part of West Tennessee, and we try to instill that into the farm on how we do business on a day-to-day basis. So it, it's a great pride and honor that that I sit over that place, and and I, I oversee that for the McCorder family and have for for going on eight years now. Had had you been there before when they first approached you? No, I never never knew where Palmersville was. Uh, so and it was it was a pretty funny story. Is Mike picked me up in Jackson. And we, we drove up to the farm and we pull up and it's just beautiful entrance way on this big rolling hill farm in, in kind of uh, the northwestern corner there of, of Weekly County or northeastern corner of Weekly County. And we got up there and the gates were locked and Mike's fumbling through keys and, and we couldn't even get in. He, we didn't even have a key to get in. So we, we climbed the gates and go up there and look around and. Uh, you know, and left and, and kind of worked this plan out on what do we want to do. But it was it was a place that neither one of us had spent a lot of time. Uh, you know, uh, Mike and them had been removed from that area for, for a little while. And uh, th- that place was uh, just kind of there, just ready to be put back together. And so were there were there was there any cattle farming going on? Yeah, there, there the was about 20 cows hanging on. Okay. Uh, they they were having some uh, uh, you know there was some some gen- some people that had worked for the governor that were still around uh, uh, you know they were kind of helping up keep fences and keep a few stock around uh, uh, but they were kind of on their uh, later years in life so uh, we we went through there and and um, and sold those cattle out and and kind of just got a blank canvas and restarted. Was there uh, like a Ned McWhorter office up yes. there still? Yeah, I guess my office now was the uh, quote unquote poker room uh, that the governor had. And, and kind of as the story Mike tells, there's probably more state business handled right there than there ever was in Nashville. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty neat place. Is there uh, is there tours or anything that go on? We, we, we host groups daily. We just got through with a big Farm Bureau tour uh, last week uh, that was kind of the STEM tour. Uh, that, that Farm Bureau hosted uh, of science and math teachers from all over the United States came through there and, and we spent a good couple hours with them on the farm. So it's a day-to-day cattle operation now. Uh, so there, there's tractors in and out of there. There's trailers in and out of there. We're, we're, we work daily. Uh, there, there's full-time help there now, but we do accommodate anybody that wants to come through and, and see the place. We love to have them. So I'm curious, um, you come see this place you know, you've obviously already got a job and you're thinking, you know, you're making the decision to make the jump and you do. What what are some of the first things that you do when you start 
managing this farm? Yeah, well, it, it kind of starts on the infrastructure side for us. So we go through and we evaluate the fences, the facilities, how, how much cattle can we run here? Are, are we prepared to run here uh, yet? So we, we kind of started there and, and there was some maintenance that was needed. So we, we started on the maintenance first. And then where it's the fun part of my job for me, being a, being kind of a purebred guy, is I get to start evaluating where do I want to go to purchase those females that we set the foundation with here at McWhorter. And so then I started shopping, basically. Uh, and, and we identified some cows and some different herds throughout the nation and brought them in. And, and those have really set the foundation for us. And then it was just set on grow. And we just started utilizing those females through various practices that we use, the embryo transfer program, the in vitro fertilization program, the artificial insemination programs that we use. And, and we started growing the cow herd. Uh, and that's kind of really got us to where we are today. So, so if I'm in your boots and I go to a, a sale, uh, mm-hmm. And I'm starting off this new uh, cattle operation. What am I looking for? What attributes and traits am I looking for at the auction when I'm looking at black angle? Well, it, it kind of depends on what you want to focus on. My passion is the bull industry, is the bull business of the, of this side of the industry. So I, I, w- I love working with the commercial cattlemen, uh, just the, the gentleman from 25 cows to 2,500 cows. And, and his, his main objective is to, I need the most pounds at weaning, and that's how I get paid. So what I first thing I do is I go through and identify all the mothers that are, that are carrying the characteristics that I want. Uh, that's, that's how you start any herd is you find the mamas. You find the mamas, then we can, we can go to work. So we go look for those cows that are weaning, weaning big calves off at weaning, uh, that are doing that on less inputs. They're being able to survive mostly on grass, feed only when needed. Uh, through the through the winter months or through the breeding season and calving season, uh, so they're structurally sound. We I build my cattle from the ground up, so you find good feet and legs and good structures. Those are what make bulls that last a long time for people, and so that's how we do it. And so uh, then you go over to the to the daddy cows, and what are you looking for there? That's the same thing. Same thing. You, you kind of you can you can the cow will produce about sixty percent of that calf. So you've got sixty percent to work with there, and you've got forty percent to kind of fix some things she may not do well. So if we need to increase some growth, we'll do that from the bull side. Uh, if we need to to maybe find a cow that kind of is adequate in growth that may need a little help on feet and legs structure side, we'll find that from the bull side. We increase the carcass merit in them from the bull side, uh, so we can imp- marbling side marbling score ribeye size tenderness all those we can kind of use from the bull side. So there, there's, there's kind of traits. It's just a balancing act. It's, we can kind of get so much from one and so much from the other to, we're all hunting that one. We've yet to, you know, get that perfect one, but that's the goal is, is who does the most of everything the best. And so, uh, you have, I'm assuming they have the genetics of each animal who it was bred with through the years. That That's right. right. Yeah. Well, not necessarily the breeding of them, but I can look back at a pedigree just if anybody was to buy a registered dog or horse or anything back. And I, so we can trace them back that way to make sure we're not bringing in some bloodlines that are a little close together. Um, and, and so, but then we've got a set of numbers or EPDs uh, that we kind of go off of from the Angus Association. And that kind of gives us some direction into some categories uh, that we kind of made around. And how long have you now been managing the farm? I'll be coming on eight years this fall. Oh, that's great. What yep. What are the um, surprises? What What did you not anticipate? Uh, you know, being a being a cowboy, we kind of tend to put uh, the the cost of everything on the back burner. So you, we absorb a lot of cost. Uh, and, and putting these places together, we, I guess farming is the only industry that uh, buys at retail, sells at wholesale, and pays trucking both ways. <laughs> so we we have to factor in all that. So there's, you know, I, I've become a lot better businessman in my eight years, I think, than when I first started. Uh, so uh, that that's something we we all I get kind of tend to get tunnel focused on my my product, uh, which is what kind of allows us to survive. But I can get a lot of input in that product if I'm not careful. So I've become a, probably a lot better on the financials. And I hope the McWhorters listen to that. <laughs> I'm trying, guys. <laughs> it now, hasn't always been easy. <laughs> um, let's talk about lifestyle. Did you have a cowgirl already with you when you moved there, or did you no, have to recruit one? I had to recruit one. Okay. So uh, my, my wife uh, was not involved in the ag industry at all. Uh, and uh, we'll probably tell you today she's not 
very involved nor wants to be, but, but she's become a great cowgirl. She's become a, a big asset. It's as, this is a job that's not typical. There's, there's no nine to five here. It's, uh, it's seven days, uh, you know, so it, uh, the home life becomes, uh, very important for, for a good, strong, uh, you know, good hearted woman to, uh, to kind of, to kind of bear all that down. And, and I've got a great one. I'm fortunate. And you've got two, uh, little cowboys, right? That's right. I've got two and now they are cowboys. So I've got Bo that's five, uh, and, uh, he's making his rough stock debut this weekend at Martin in the mutton busting. So he's extremely excited about that. And then Baker's just one. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, they eat it up. And so, um, you guys live there on the farm? No, we actually live in Bradford. So my wife, Caitlin is from Bradford. Uh, my, uh, you know, family being here from Bradford, we built on a farm I bought here. Uh, right out of college. So we're, we're here in Bradford. So there's a lot of people that are listening right now that are accountants or in the office workers and they're listening and they're thinking, man, I'd like to, to live his life. Tell us a little bit about what your day to day is like. Yeah. Well, day to day is, uh, you know, we, obviously we, we lay eyes on all the kettle first off when we get there in the morning. So I, I've got a great herdsman Colt Cardwell that's with me at my quarter. Uh, couldn't couldn't do it without the day to day without Colt. He he allows my job can be so much on the road, so much on the phone, uh, so much in the office that that Colt really is the one that lays eyes on the cows all day. So he'll do he'll do that all morning. Um, and then we've got some guys to help feed. But then we start feeding. So we'll, usually we feed the bulls first. So that's fifty bulls right now. Then we go right into the females, and that's about one hundred and twenty females we're feeding right now. Uh, and then the wean calves or whatever doctrine needs to happen next, you know, we'll kind of knock that out. And then we'll get into our afternoon work uh, after lunch. So we'll, we'll usually feed about 200 head before before lunch and do any doctrine that we need to do before lunch. Then after dinner, uh, we'll get in any, any projects that need doing. If there's any fence that needs mending, uh, you know, if we're, if we're working on any any structural uh, for shades for the bulls, we've been building a lot of shades here lately with the way as hot as it's gotten to kind of keep these cattle cool. So any of those type projects. And then, but mine can consist of from uh, registering a group of wean calves in the morning or, or being on the phone with a, a stalker calf buyer in Nebraska at 10 o'clock or, uh, you know, handling with them the financials with with miss madeline pritchett that that handles our books for the farm and our you know it's it, it's vast there's it's it's different every day that's that's one thing that's good about it and we, and we kind of do get to set our own schedules uh it's a it's you know it, there's a lot of freedom that comes with this job uh you know but uh, there's a lot that has to be done as well do you have a trusty a sidekick horse that you've whistle and it yeah we, we got two right now uh let's see we're riding jack daily and then uh, we've got a we've got a new a new little four-year-old that's in from Nebraska that's proven to be quite a project for us that we're uh, we're going to get we're going to get worked out here soon. Now we're going to in a minute we're going to talk a little bit about innovation um, yeah. in in your industry. Um, but first, I'm curious uh, what what is the uh, biggest challenge that you face day to day in your business? Uh, probably, probably one of the biggest pushes we're right now is, is the fact that we've got such a large, uh, population in this country that doesn't understand where their food stuff's come from. Uh, you know, and so we can kind of tend to see the, the animal aspect of agriculture can be in the crossfires a lot, uh, due to misinformation and, and, um, all those different aspects. So we do have, we're, we're fighting that constantly. Uh, you know, my, I've got a friend that's got a saying that the cattle industry is probably the only industry that makes a paddle big enough for everybody's behind. So from the top down, we can, uh, you know, from, like I said, we, we don't have any control over our prices, our market prices. We don't have any control over the commodity prices for the feedstuffs we have to grow. So there are some real challenges that, that go into this, that, that it takes all of us working together to, to, to get them to make us all through. Um, obviously, you're aware of our exhibit on innovation in agriculture that we opened earlier this year. It's been really popular and a really great way people are finding out more about innovation in agriculture. Why don't you speak a little bit about um, what you wish people knew about farming cattle? Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of that exhibit, I had a small part in that exhibit. I, I serve on the Tennessee Beef Industry Council, so uh, I, I was kind of a part of what we got to put into that exhibit and was there for the, the grand opening of that, and it is. It's to have that in West Tennessee, I was a huge, I was pushing for that extremely hard. 
uh, any of the money to come back to West Tennessee. A lot of times we see that cattle money get focused in middle and East Tennessee, and I was screaming for it to come back here. So we, we were able to get that done, and, and that's just, man, that's that's amazing. That That's so cool for the for those kids and everybody in this kind of area to kind of get through there and, and see what all. West Tennessee is so diverse in its agriculture, what all we can do from, from the crop side to the to the cattle side, to the technology side, what's happening in Memphis. There's so many things that, that kind of go in ag that's based through West Tennessee. So it's, it's a great, so congratulations on that. We, we thank you from the ag side. Thank, thank you, you for the positive message. For Appreciate it. And we have, you know, it is, it is fun to get to watch people come, uh, children and adults come and see and learn and, and uh, really get involved in agriculture. People who come here from all over who don't know anything about agriculture. So it has been fun uh, getting to see that. That's right. That's right. From a cattle standpoint, I know, you know, that industry, you know, has innovation just like everything else in agriculture. So, you know, what are you seeing in the industry? What are the innovations you think that are contributing in a positive way to That's agriculture? Right. Well, kind of from my aspect of a, of a purebred producer, the a lot of the a lot of the innovations that we use to benefit us are the reproductive side. So, uh, from embryo transfer is a, is a tool we use quite often. Uh, in vitro fertilization is a new one that we're using quite often. What that allows us to do is propagate those more superior animals quicker. So we can go through there and I, let's say I have a donor cow and a donor cow for us is a cow that's probably a little bit of the upper echelon of, of my registered cow. She does what, what some of the other ones won't do. I can go in there and, and super ovulate her, uh, acquire those 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 pregnancies those those viable embryos out of her and put those in surrogate cows well that's just improving those better genetics quicker so we do a lot of that so the, so the reproductive traits and reproductive uh, innovations for us is, is where we see the biggest influence in in the registered business uh, and then because there's a trickle down effect there the more of those better genetics i'm getting out there is the more of those better genetics in the bulls that i'm moving that then finds its way to the commercial cattleman within which finds its way into the feedlot and then eventually to the slaughter plant and on the rail and on your plate. So, it, you know, there's a trickle down effect that, that we kind of like to, I guess maybe it's just us purebred guys saying that we kind of say it starts with us and then it, it kind of, kind of goes down from there. So the reproductive is the, is the biggest deal, uh, you know, on the, on the registered side of things. What about, uh, from the perspective of, uh, healthcare, like what are some of the threats that are solved by innovation today with the health? Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, we, we run stringent uh, vaccination protocols here at the farm. Uh, you know, our cows are vaccinated twice a year. Uh, you know, so we, we tried to uh, to keep a lot of sickness and a lot of health sickness out of the cattle, health in the cattle, uh, you know, so that we are putting a safe product out there. Uh, you know, there's a there's a, a big push. Uh, there's different aspects of the industry. You know, you have your your non antibiotic, your your non hormone added lines. You know that that are that are great. Uh, you know, they, they, there's a place for those as well. Uh, but then there are O's that us in the seed stock business. It's a little bit more a little bit more crucial for us to to make sure things are vaccinated. Uh, you know, to kind of keep a healthy product. There's so much cattle coming in and out that those things can sometimes have a tendency. To, you know, can kind of get some sickness just from the simple moving around and stuff. So. We, uh, we do vaccinate. So on the health side of it is, is a big deal. Um, and then I noticed um, that you guys are having an inaugural uh, sale coming up. To, to That's right. The first one. Man, yeah. we're excited. This is eight years in the work for us. So uh, like I, I kind of put it in my letter, we've kind of kept the door shut for the last eight years on this place. And uh, we, we've kind of grown bulls and sold bulls as we've needed to. But this is the first big auction that we're going to have from a quarter. So it's our service-driven auction. Uh, that, that's kind of our tagline for it. So we, we kind of, our service to the producer is kind of what's helped us put us in a, a, a beneficial situation. What are we doing that the other people aren't? Uh, so yeah, October the 16th in Palmersville, uh, you know, we're going to sell 40 bulls and 50 registered females and another 50 commercial females. So this is going to be a big auction for us. We're excited. That sounds like an event kind of is it is an event. Yeah. It's it's open to all. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna kick it off with lunch on Saturday and the auction at two and then a big supper afterwards. It's gonna we're putting up the tents. So I, so I'm just I'm writing down the date because I wanna come check that out. We it, want you to. Does uh you know, if other people want to uh, check it out. We're not ending the podcast right now, but if other people right. want to check it out, they can go on your website. And- oh, that's right. Yeah. McQuarterFarms.com. Obviously, uh, we're big on Facebook, uh, Instagram as well. So you can find us, find, find us anyway. So it's, uh, yeah. 
Okay, well, I'm, I'm, a, I am definitely going to be there, and I'll take pictures and put them on my own social. That'd be media, great. So. We want all the more the better. I'm, I'm probably not going to buy anything, but purchase not required. Okay, good. Purchase. I can look. <laughs> um, talk a little bit more about what frustrates you when you're watching TV and you see bad information about cattle farming and and cattle, and you know what, what, what frustrates you the most when you're watching? What information are people not getting? Right. Well, what, what frustrates me the most is, is us as producers. That lack of information or lack of misinformation is much our fault as it is anybody else's. We, we get complacent and get busy on our day-to-day, and we forget that education is the number one key to this business. If, if we're not informing the public and letting them know what we're doing, they're, they're so easy for misinformation. And those are the people that are supporting us. So that's my that's my number one is 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 I, I I don't like us when we put the blame on well they don't know well they don't know because we haven't told them that's why they don't know so what, what I do think as the industry as a whole is it's realizing that probably now more than ever uh, with the money that's being put into the exhibits like you all are operating and and so we've got to know because it is every day that we're getting the majority of people are getting further and further away from knowing where their food source comes from so. One as a whole, you know, there, there's so much misinformation and, and, and you know, the, are, are the antibiotics safe? You know, I'm, I'm, eating, I'm eating meat from an animal that's been vaccinated. You know, we, there's so much studies and science that goes on to that that you can negate that, that fairly quick. Uh, you know, there's uh, the, the hormone issue. Why do we do what we do, uh, you know, on, on a hormone issue is because uh, we're, we're needing to feed quicker, more. Uh, you know, so we're, we're, we kind of have to do that way. So, but most of 90% of the problem is, is, uh, is we're not out there on the forefront, stopping the information before it gets spread to the masses. Um, yeah. So I think that's why places like Discovery Park of America, I think are important to help people learn more about agriculture. You know, we're certainly here to continue our relationship with farmers like you, um, Absolutely. Going forward. Uh, what's what, So you got your big sale. So you're really working. Yep. Your eyes are towards, you know, that's in October. That's right. Yes. What's the future of McWhorter Farms? What else you got cooking? Yeah, well, growth, obviously. You know, we, we don't want 40 bulls to be the, the max for this sale. So, we you know, we, our goal is by 2024 to be selling 100 purebred bulls a year. Uh, so, so growth uh, is still key. Uh, so that that's kind of where we're headed, and with that opens up the doors for a lot of things. We we are we're obviously uh, you know we we're gonna we offer a buyback program. So you, you won't be familiar with that, but if you use McWhorter sired bulls and you're a commercial cattleman, we want to be that first offer on to get your calves bought back. What we do, we're we're tied in with a couple big outfits in Nebraska that'll kind of help buy cattle and feed cattle and then process cattle. So kind of uh, that kind of allows us to be the full circle of the industry. So that that's kind of where we're going. Is is we don't necessarily need to be the biggest, uh, but uh, if if we kind of stay big enough that we're extremely relevant, but we're not so big that we're not raising our product right, is where we want to be. So superior product first, c- customer service first, then we kind of let the growth fill that those needs. How, how, you know. Is the demand for our product there allowing us to grow? So it, it's going to happen kind of uh, naturally, organically, kind of see how it takes and goes. But uh, there's no stopping me yet. And so, um, uh, former governor, uh, the late former governor, um, does he have any of or any of his grandchildren interested in? Yeah, well, so we're working. Mike has two children, Walker and Bess. Uh, so Walker, who uh, had more degrees than I could list from, from, a, from accounting to law is, is actually, of course, the McWhorter's businesses are, are distributorships. Uh, so Walker's working with the distributorship, but he's, he's kind of found a, an interest, a little itch in the, in the cow business. So here in the last year or two, we've started working with Walker more. Um, and, and, that, and he's been a great kind of liaison between myself and Mike. You know, Mike, not really a cowboy, not really interested in being one. So, it, so that's kind of made mine and his job sometimes interesting, you know, from him being such a business centered gentleman and not knowing the cattle business to me being such a cowboy and not probably being near as business centered as he would have likened me to be. Walker's been a good mix for us. So he, he's kind of can, can kind of narrate it and, and has, has developed a passion for the, for the breed. So uh, we're going to work with him now. That's fascinating. That's yeah. that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And it's not day to day. You know, Walker manages one of the distributors in West Memphis, Arkansas for him. So he spends a lot of his time down there. But 
but he does make a point to to be really involved with us on the farm side. And they're they're Coke distributors, right? No, Budweiser. Oh, Anheuser Budweiser. Bush. Okay, that's right. Anheuser Busch. So they have Jackson, uh, which is Central Distributors, Dresden, which is Volunteer Distributors, and now West Memphis, Arkansas, which is Best Beverage Distributors. Gotcha. Okay, so, fantastic. Well, this has yep. been really interesting for people who want to find out more. Who maybe we've sparked a moment of inspiration for somebody. Where where can they go to find out more about uh, Black Angus cattle and and raising cattle in general? Yeah, if you want for the Angus side, you can go to www.angus.org. That's the website for the American Angus Association. There you can find everything you could dream of. Uh, information on upcoming sales or sale catalogs or sale reports or, or how to become a member. What is an Angus? Uh, you know, what, what combines an Angus? You know, how to understand the pedigrees and the EPDs of an Angus. So that's a great start. But your best place is to find producers like us that can kind of dumb it down for you. Uh, you know, make it a little bit easier to understand. Uh, you know, obviously you can find us any, any, any way, but, uh, you know, if you're just curious on Angus, that, that's a great, that's a great little uh, place to start. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. If anybody wants to join us at your, uh, auction, um, how do they find out more about that? That's right. Yeah. Go. So you can go to mcquarterfarms.com there. You can, uh, you can go to the contact us section of our website and enter in all your information that gets you included on our email list and our, our print, our print, li- our print mail. Uh, so you can do that way. That'll get you signed up for sale catalogs and all that stuff. Or you can find us on Facebook at McCorder Farms or Instagram uh, at McCorder Farms. And, and that's, uh, that's all coming up. Yeah. October the 16th, uh, two o'clock. Uh, I think that address is 777 Max Grove Road, Dresden, uh, is where the auction will be set up. Fantastic. Well, I will definitely see you there. We we look forward to it. Come early and stay late. Uh, (laughs) You know, the McQuarters businesses will make for a a fun evening. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, And and thanks a lot to all of you listeners who joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond, to plan an experience here for you and your family. Visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. dot com.